So very good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you again uh, on the third, third masterclass in masterclass series two of uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology. As you're aware that uh, this time in the masterclass two, we are discussing the clinical case scenario and mainly directed towards our, our trainees in gastroenterology, both DM and DNB. So this was a thought came uh, some time back that uh, after we had a first masterclass series, that uh, we should have a, some clinical case discussion. And therefore, we took this decision to do at least 12, 12 classes uh, for clinical case discussion. And, and uh, this is third in series. Last week, we discussed a case who had a large bubble diarrhea and intestinal obstructive disease. But this year, we'll discuss a case. Uh, this session, today, we'll discuss a very important case of chronic constipation and how do you approach. I know chronic constipation is a very, very common disease. Uh, and we see that too in very commonly in our clinical practice. Therefore, it very, is very important uh, to know about uh, how do you approach a patient with chronic constipation. There are a number of uh, confusion uh, in the uh, terminology, uh, various terminology we use in chronic constipation, and furthermore, the approach. But therefore, we took this uh, decision that uh, let's dedicate one masterclass uh, to how best we approach a patient who comes with chronic constipation of uh, short duration, mainly for long duration. How do you approach that? And to do this, uh, we have this masterclass where we have a, uh, uh, two great uh, teachers, uh, Dr. Amit Datta. He's a, a professor of gastroenterology at the CMC Velour. And we have Dr. Praveen Rathi, again, uh, one with a distinct teacher and, uh, and from Mumbai. I will also join uh, in the discussion in between. And to facilitate uh, uh, this today's masterclass is Dr. Sridhar, a uh, very, very active uh, uh, a young member of our, our society. Not so young, but again, uh, he's, a, he's a consultant at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. Very dedicated and uh, very efficient. Uh, you will see uh, that how well he performs today. Uh, to do the two cases, we have two, again, bright residents, uh, who are second year residents from, uh, from uh, CMC. And may I request uh, uh, Dr. Amit to please uh, uh, introduce both the residents who will discuss the case. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. And first of all, I'd like to thank ISG, uh, Dr. Govind, Dr. Rakesh Koshal for providing us this opportunity to discuss this case of uh, case series today, second two cases. And you've already been introduced to the panels. So the cases today will be presented by a couple of our uh, residents. Dr. John Titus will present the first case and Dr. Nicholas will present the second case. So as we all know, as Dr. Govind has said that chronic constipation is actually a very common problem we see almost every day in our practice. And the nature of the symptom, the severity of symptom really varies. You know, and you have diagnostic tests, you have therapeutic modalities, but you need to make a decision that which person should be investigated, how much, how should we manage a patient, most patients do not require a lot of investigation. Okay, so therefore, a very good clinical approach is essential, which means a good history followed by examination, and then you can decide on how to proceed further. So, so we'll start with the first case to be presented by Dr. John Titus. Over to you, John. Amit, one more thing I want to uh, highlight, uh, that uh, this is a case discussion we are doing like a panel, and uh, we'll request all the parts, part participants uh, to ask questions in the chat box. So write your questions. So we'll try to respond as many questions as possible. This is number one. And number two, there will be certain poll questions. So do participate in uh, putting a response to uh, the poll questions. And uh, we go by now, uh, Dr. Amit, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so I think we can start with the first case discussion by Dr. John. Yeah. So, so John, we can't hear you. Are you muted? muted? Sorry. Uh, wrestling a 24-year-old male who is an MA student from uh, Patna who complains of constipation for the last uh, six years. So he was well till uh, six years back when he noticed a decrease in frequency in, in his stool over a, few, uh, over a period of a few months. He complained of passing stools only once in five to seven days. Uh, his stools were lumpy and pellet shaped, uh, corresponding to a Bristol stool form scale of 1 bar 2. 
he had to he had a feeling of incomplete evacuation of stools and he had to strain while passing stools he also complained of abdominal bloating uh, when he did not pass stools he did not perceive an obstruction or blockage in the anal canal he did not have any maneuver he did not have to use any maneuvers to facilitate defecation and he did not have a strong urge to defecate Uh, he did not have abdominal pain, and his abdominal pain, uh, we specifically asked for pain which was triggered or relieved by bowel movements, which was not there in this patient. He did not have history of blood in stools. There was no mucus in the stools. He did not have vomiting, and there was no history of alternating loose or hard stools. He did not have any coexisting dyspeptic or flux symptoms. Uh, there was no history of weight loss, and there was no history of prolonged fever. Uh, treatment history. So at the onset of uh, symptoms, he tried isacol powder for uh, six months. However, uh, with this, he only had a partial response. His uh, Bristol stool form uh, increased to more than three. He was passing stools around uh, three times a week. However, he continued to have a feeling of incomplete evacuation of stools, and he still had to strain while passing stools. He later then took uh, lactulose syrup for around six months. Again, he had a partial response with the same. Uh, he then uh, tried Ayurvedic medications for two years and later tried homeopathic medication for three years. With both, he had only a partial response. Uh, he also tried uh, magnesium con containing laxatives and lubricants uh, with which he had a partial response. And uh, he, his stool frequency had only become three to four times a week, and his feeling of incomplete evacuation persisted. Uh, this is the timeline of his lactative usage. So, as I mentioned, he had used isabul powder for initially for some time. Later on, he used la lactulose. Uh, after which, he used Ayurvedic medications. Then he changed over to homeopathic medications. He tried the uh, magnesium salt lactatives uh, for some time. At the same time, however, uh, he only had a partial response with the same. Uh, there were no symptoms to suggest neurological dysfunction. Uh, uh, symptoms like more lower limb weakness, bowel or bladder issues. We asked specifically for this uh, history. He did not have any such problem. Uh, there was no comorbid illnesses like diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, or systemic hypertension. There was no history of taking any regular medications like uh, calcium channel blockers, antipsychotics, or opioids. Uh, he did not have any surgeries in the past, and there was no history of uh, spinal cord injury. Uh, diet history: He was a uh, consuming a predominantly vegetarian diet. He, his calorie intake was 1,500 kilocalories with 40 grams of protein. He had limited fresh fruit and vegetable intake, and his fluid intake was adequate, uh, around two to three liters per day. His uh, personal history, he did not have any addictions uh, like smoking. He uh, had a physical activity of walking around 45 to minutes to one hour every day. He is currently pursuing an MA degree. He did not have any history of anxiety, depression, or other psychiatric illnesses. He did not uh, consume any psychiatric medications. Uh, his personal life and studies were adversely affected by the illness. Uh, his family history, there was no family history of uh, GI malignancies, and there were no similar complaints in the family. So uh, summarizing the history, this is a 24-year-old male with no comorbidities or addictions, with constipation for six years, with a history of incomplete evacuation of stools and straining to pass stools, with no alarm symptoms or symptoms suggestive of systemic illness. He has tried multiple laxatives with which he has had only a partial relief of symptoms. Uh, so uh, I guess after the summary, we have uh, uh, a couple of questions for, for the audience poll. So this is the first question. Uh, uh, if you can just put up the poll. So which of these is not uh, an alarm symptom in a patient with constipation? Age less than 45 years, recent onset constipation, 
weight loss, family history of GI malignancy, and change in stool caliber. Uh, we don't have we don't have choice five choice five is just a, a vacant space i think it's change in uh, change in stool change caliber, in stool caliber sir. okay change, change stool in stool caliber. caliber yeah yeah <laughs> okay uh so i guess uh this was a simple one and uh, so i guess uh, all of us know that uh, so majority like expected 92 percent have answered that age less than 45 years is uh the right answer so uh, just to reiterate the alarm symptoms and constipation, because this is uh, very relevant uh, as a clinician to know. So age more than 45 years, change in stool caliber, any blood in stool, unintended weight loss, fever, uh, history of GI malignancy in the family, any iron deficiency anemia, recent onset of constipation, uh, any rectal prolapse, or rectal bleeding, vomiting, and loss of appetite. All of these are alarm symptoms and something that all clinicians should look for in a patient who presents with constipation. Uh, so coming to the next question for the poll. So as per the present history that has been given by Dr. John, what do you think is the type of constipation in this patient? So normal transit, slow transit, uh, dyssynergic defecation, mixed type, or none of the above, the possible organic etiology. So I think we are going to have a mixed bag. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Sidra, we'd like to tell the response yeah. to, I'm not sure they are able to see the uh, so, poll so results. So out of 145 people who've answered, 55% uh, felt this was slow transit, 17% felt this was dyssynergic defecation, 12% felt it was normal transit, and 12% felt it was a mixed type. 3% uh, felt that there was a possible organic etiology here. So majority went with slow transit and 17% with dysenergic defecation. So, uh, so just to uh, a brief uh, primer on uh, the Rome 4 has defined functional constipation uh, based on these symptoms wherein you have to have two or more of the following six that is training uh, uh, during more than 25% of the stools. They usually ask to maintain a chart for a week. And lumpy or hard stools in more than 25% of uh, defecation, sensation of incomplete evacuation for more than 25% of uh, defecations, sensation of inorectal obstruction or blockage, manual maneuvers to facilitate uh, 20, more than 25% of defecation, and fewer than three spontaneous bowel movements per week. Now, the loose stool should rarely be present without the use of laxatives, and they should not fulfill the criteria for IBS. And these criteria should be fulfilled for at least three months with symptom onset at least six months prior to the diagnosis. Uh, so functional constipation is uh, again divided into three types, normal transit, uh, wherein all the physiological tests are normal, uh, ex except maybe the barostat, which may be abnormal, uh, slow transit constipation, wherein uh, there is decreased in the uh, physical colonic motor activity, and dyssynergic defecation, uh, wherein there is poor coordination between pel pelvic floor and anal sphincter function. So there can be considerable amount of overlap between these, uh, but again, uh, these are the broad categories. Uh, so as a student, it is important uh, because this might be asked in the exam, what is the normal physiology of uh, uh, defecation? So the normal uh, uh, physiology of defecation would involve uh, the stool passing into the rectum with sensory perception of stool. Uh, the recto anal inhibitory reflex leads to uh, a relaxation of the internal anal sphincter. Subsequently, if the situation is appropriate, uh, there is a contraction of the diaphragm, abdomen, and uh, rectal muscles with relaxation of the external anal sphincter and relaxation of the puborectalis, which straightens the inorectal angle and facilitates for uh, uh, you know, passage of stools across the uh, anal sphincter. So you can see in, uh, in the defogram photos also that the inorectal angle initially acute after the relaxation of the puborectalis and the, becomes straighter. So this is the normal physiology of def defecation, which may be asked in the exam if you get a case of constipation. So uh, 
last question for the poll before we go on to the examination so what proportion of indian patients with chronic constipation have dyssynergic defecation Uh, okay, so out of one hundred and can I think end the poll? Yeah, so one fifty nine people have answered, and the majority fifty three percent feel it is twenty percent, thirty seven percent feel it is forty percent, nine percent feel it sixty percent. The answer is forty percent. There were two studies, both of which uh, showed a figure that was roughly close to forty percent. Uh, one from Mumbai, which showed the figure was forty percent exactly, and uh, one from SGPJ, which showed the figure was thirty six percent. So uh, there are some pointers to dyssynergic defecation that we have to look for in history. So there has, there has to be a history of incomplete evacuation, excessive straining, sense of inorectal obstruction or blockage, and the need for maneuvers like fingering or a vaginal pressure to evacuate. The stool frequency may be low in these patients. Uh, not necessarily always they will have reurge, and there might be history of obstetric trauma or sexual abuse in these patients. Uh, I think we'll go to the diagnosis. I think John, you can. So John, so yeah, so John, we need to know based on whatever you have taken history from this patient, what's your complete diagnosis? Can you tell us your complete diagnosis, John? Yes. So, so at the end of history, I would uh, 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 the diagnosis would be the, the syndromic diagnosis would be that of a chronic constipation. Etiology I would put as probably functional, uh, and the type of uh, constipation I would he had features suggestive of an incomplete evacuation of stool. He also had straining to pass through. However, he did not have a persistent urge to pass through. So, first, I would consider dyssynergic uh, defecation. However, I would also keep a, a slow transit constipation in the back of my mind. Uh, he also did not have, he had only a partial response to bulk forming, osmotic, and alternative uh, medications. He did not have comorbid illnesses and he did not have any concomitant drug intake. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. So, Dr. Raki, if you want to ask some questions to John at this stage. Dr. Raki, want to ask, uh, or Amit, you continue. Yeah. So, continue. Think John, so the thing, the first question, John, I want to ask you is that, you know, so let's go by, you know, so obviously constipation is something. So, how did you, how do you objectively say that the patient has constipation, John? What parameters you look for? See, constipation, the patient will tell you that. I have constipation. So, how do you differentiate a subjective constipation from an objective constipation? So, so uh, uh, we we look at the stool frequency. So, this patient had a stool frequency of passing only once in five to seven days. Less than three per week is generally taken as constipation. The mm -hmm. second uh, uh, factor is the Bristol stool form scale. Yeah, very good. Constipation we would expect in Indians up to three is uh, taken as constipation. However, uh, in the Western literature, up to two is taken as constipation. And the other associated uh, symptoms, which can further classify as urge and uh, uh, inorectal blockage. So, so essentially, what you're saying is because the stool frequency is low and the Bristol stool form is, is showing type one or two in this patient. So, these are very strong pointers for objective identification of constipation. Now, why did you say it is uh, functional? Why not organic in this particular uh, situation? So, so he's a 24-year-old male. Uh, I, we had asked specifically for other comorbid illnesses, which he did not have. He did not have hypothyroidism. He did not have diabetes. He does not have the uh, ask for history suggestive of a neuro neurological uh, dysfunction. He did not have limb weakness or sensory abnormalities. And other issues like uh, we asked for drug intake. He did not have any significant uh, drug intake like calcium channel blockers. Opioids or specifically antipsychotics, which could have caused this, and hence we would consider a functional in him. So basically, what you have said is those secondary causes, but how did you say it is not an organic, any other organic colonic pathology causing constipation? So those are the secondary causes, which, as you say, but how did you say it's not an organic colonic condition causing this problem? Uh, so so uh, he did not have any alarm symptoms, yeah. which would suggest a. Uh, uh, so, so what alarm features you 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 say what alarm? Can you just want to reiterate that what alarm features you asked for? So, so uh, one is uh, loss of weight, uh, blood in stool, 
recent change in cannula bulb obstruction and um, uh, or abdominal pain which will be one of the uh, features which would suggest uh, sure let's go cool. uh, See now, if you look at the audience poll, most of them actually you now voted for this slow transit or the other ones. I think, but you're uh, you're saying it's most likely a dyssynergic defecation. So why do you say it's a dyssynergic defecation in this particular patient? So, so the points in favor of a dyssynergic defecation are uh, that he had a feeling of incomplete evacuation of stool, and he also had to strain while passing stool. Uh, but uh, a, a point against it is that he did not have a persistent urge to pass. But however, in some patients, this may be absent. So, because of these two, uh, uh, these history, I would consider that as the first differential. And then later, I would also consider the slow transit uh, constipation uh, and look for it. Dr. Govind, sir, you want to ask any question to John at this stage? No, I, I, I think. Uh... Uh, this fine. Uh, only thing that a lot of people, a lot of our participants uh, felt this is a slow transit constipation, yes, uh, yes. not the pelvic or dysynergia. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to differentiate these two conditions uh, in clinical practice. Uh, please remember one point uh, uh, that uh, every disease has a spectrum. And uh, the classical manifestations, uh, which are our textbook rights or, or we have been taught from, from early part of our uh, education in medicine, that think uh, the as disease advances, so the symptom and signs become more classical, and they are defined as a uh, definitions of a particular disease. Please remember, every disease has to, to has to go through a spectrum of uh, its illness, and and therefore many patients can have overlapping features. Once they as they become classical at the uh, end spectrum, uh, as far you go in the disease duration, you find more more classified symptoms. Uh, more classical symptoms, but earlier you can have overlap. And we need to keep in mind as a specialist because a patient will come to us at a different point of time in the disease course. Some will come uh, uh, midway, then symptom signs may not be so classical. Some will come at end stage where the symptoms and clients are very classical and some will come early, which uh, may overlap with a normal uh, habit. For example, constipation, uh, we believe that uh, if you ask constipation in a population, almost 50% of our people will say, uh, I'm constipated. But he put into wrong definition, which Dr. Siddharth, uh, uh, Dr. Sridhar and, uh, and John, and I mean, this just discussed that uh, chronic constipation, if you put them into criteria of wrong four or any definition, then only 10 to 15% patient will have a typical constipation. 30 to 40%, 30% of people just have a, perception of constipation. They don't have constipation actually, but they, they feel that they have constipation. And this I uh, name as a perceived constipation. I believe I'm constipated, but naturally this is not a constipation. And th this is very important to differentiate. A lot of patients will come to us that I'm constipated, but you ask them, they say I pass stool every day. There's no almost normal caliber, but I want to pass three times a day. So I, 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 or I have to go three times a day in the morning. So, and they call it constipation. So please uh, uh, more more and dissect out the uh, type. And this is the uh, thing which can help differentiate this is a perceived constipation or organic constipation. Perceived constipation, organic means functional constipation. Perceived constipation may not require any treatment except for reassurance. Whereas uh, uh, the other constipation, like those who have fulfilled the defined criteria for constipation, certainly will require some amount of pharmacological therapy and some will require investigative approach. Thank you, sir. That's a very important point. In fact, I think we, I looked at the study done by your group also where you found that the perceived was so much higher in the population in that Balab in the Haryana area compared to the this thing. So there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat box before we proceed further. I think Dr. Uh, Jayanti has asked that, uh, does this patient have any, uh, John, any other investigations also apart from the history, which you did investigations done before he came to CMC for his symptoms of constipation? Any, any specialized tests done or something? So he had a, a metabolic workup done. So uh, thyroid function tests were normal outside and basic uh, blood, so uh, CBC and electrolytes and sugar levels were done, which were normal. He had a, basically all the metabolic tests done, but no other thing for a structural. Okay. Uh, there's another question also, John, which is very important, actually, again, which you presented, because in your history, you were saying patient had partial response, partial response. So the question is, how do you assess response to laxatives? Is there any uh, definition to do that? So uh, 
sir. So uh, one we can assess is uh, based on both the symptoms and maybe looking at the Bristol stool forms case. So like this patient after giving lactitol, he had a change in his Bristol stool form scale from uh, one to two to more than three. However, his symptoms persisted. Though his uh, bowel uh, frequency also increased, his symptoms persisted. Like he still uh, continued to have a, a feeling of incomplete evacuation. He still had to strain to pass stool. So because of these uh, parameters, I would say he had only a partial response to the lactitol. So that's Maybe again a very important point. Yes, sir. so, so but if you add, if you look at all the clinical trials in constipation, they would say. 30% improvement in spontaneous bowel movement yes, yes, on the baseline. So 30% means, uh, the, again, you look at a chart of, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, visual analog score. And if the 30% increase in improvement with one intervention, they, they are classified as a improvement uh, uh, in constipation. Yeah, so essentially, I think, so what, what we have discussed is like, see, when you ask history for constipation, there are these parameters to ask about straining, the urge, manual maneuvers, all that. So again, the bowel movements per week. So when you are assessing response, the same things you have to go back. Whatever problems patient had at the presentation in terms of his stool frequency, in terms of the consistency, digital maneuvers, straining, feeling of incomplete. Those are the same parameters you assess when you are assessing the response. And as Dr. Govind was saying that in clinical trials, the most commonly used parameter is a complete spontaneous bowel movement. And they look at a CSBM of at least three or more per week as one of the endpoints in trials actually. But for our patients, remember, apart from bowel movement, other perception thing is also very important because if those are not improving, then the patient's quality of life may still not be better. Even though you have three movements a week, it may not be very, uh, you know, patient may not be still feeling much better than what he was. Uh, we have Dr. Praveen to ask anything or shall we proceed for this? I think we are having some problem with his link. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir, sir. Now you are. Yes, sir. Please, sir. please uh, go ahead, sir. I think my video is not there. Okay. So you can, we can hear you very clearly, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, continue then. No, no, no sir. Please. So you can ask some questions, sir. Please, please ask some questions, sir, for, at this stage. So, no, just now I have joined. So I don't know. We have finished up to what? So, the, so John has just now given his uh, history and this is the diagnosis, the syndromic diagnosis he has put at the end of his history. Okay. So these are we have discussed about this these things. So do you like to ask some questions on this syndromic thing, or, or we can proceed further? I think we can proceed. Okay. So then let's move on to the examination. Yeah. On examination, his pulse rate was eighty-four per minute. His blood pressure was one hundred and ten by seventy millimeters of mercury. His respiratory rate was sixteen per minute. His height was one sixty-four centimeters with a weight of fifty-seven kgs, and his BMI was twenty-one point two kg per meter square. There was no parallel express clubbing cyanosis, lymphadenopathy, or fetal edema. His thyroid was not palpable. On abdominal examination, on inspection, the abdomen was scaphoid. All quadrants were moving equally with respiration. There were no visible masses, no scars or sinuses, and there was no visible peristalsis. On palpation, his abdomen was soft, non tender. There was no organomegaly. There were no palpable masses, and there was no free fluid. His uh, liver span was 15 centimeters and he had normal bowel sounds. His uh, CNN examination, higher mental functions, cranial nerves were normal. Motor power was 5 by 5 in both the upper and lower limbs. His uh, deep tendon reflexes were normal and his sensory examination was normal. His uh, cardiovascular system and respiratory system examination were also normal. His uh, perrectal examination. On inspection, the perianal region appeared normal. There were no skin tags. There were no external hemorrhoids. On palpation, there was no tenderness. There were no fissures. And anal wing reflex was present. His uh, rectum was loaded with stools. His squeeze pressure was good. And he had a sphincter relaxation while bearing down. And his perineal descent was not abnormal. And there was no blood on the cloud finger. Uh, John, uh, before we come to the question, uh, you said perineal descent was normal. How much is the normal perineal descent? So, so up to four centimeters is normal, sir. Yeah, uh, less, uh, less than one centimeter or more than four centimeter would be abnormal. So, what is the landmark, John? We use to assess that. I mean, the, when the patient is a left lateral, what landmark you use to assess that? So, we can look. Uh, we should 
take the scale tuberosity as a landmark and uh, so if it comes below scale tuberosity then it is considered abnormal disc good yeah okay very good uh so we are going to a poll question again now so what is the positive predictive value of uh, digital rectal examination for the diagnosis of uh, dysenergic defecation Okay, we'll stop the poll now. Uh, so, one sixty people have answered, uh, and majority, I mean, forty four percent have answered eighty uh, percent, twenty three percent have answered fifty percent, and twenty two percent have answered thirty percent. So, the correct uh, the correct answer is eighty percent. Uh, uh, this is a study by Mayank Jain, uh, published in two thousand eighteen in the Indian Journal of Gastroenterology. so the steps of digital rectal examination become uh, of utmost importance uh, especially uh, because this is something that will be asked to you if you get a case of constipation in the exam so uh, this is the next thing then is this is not about exam only is about practice yeah absolutely this is this absolutely. is the exam i didn't think exam is the one thing is just a one time event but is a lifelong treating constipation so good to understand that true 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 sir so uh so of course uh, the first and foremost uh, we have to explain the procedure to alleviate any fear or anxiety that the patient has subsequently uh, uh, we uh, we have to have a good inspection with the patient in the left lateral position with the hips flexed to 90 degrees we inspect the perineum for any excoriation scar tags any condyloma any external hemorrhoids any fissure or fistulous opening or rectal prolapse uh, we evaluate for the perineal sensation and the inocutaneous uh, reflex subsequently we uh, uh, do digital palpation with a lubricated glove finger uh, uh, into the rectum so we feel the mucosa the surrounding muscle bone and adjoining structures we evaluate for any tenderness uh, spasm mass uh, rectocele stricture shell for hard stool uh, lastly we go uh, do some maneuvers we, to assess the inorectal function so we assess the rect- resting anal sphincter tone the anal canal length the inorectal angle uh, any defect in the anal sphincter we ask the patient to squeeze and evaluate the squeeze pressure and in addition to a finger in the rectum we place a hand above the abdomen and ask the patient to bear it out as if to defecate and we evaluate the push effort from the abdominal muscles the relaxation and contraction of the anal sphincter and the puborectalis the perineal descent and also if there is any interception or prolapse and lastly when we take out the finger we look for any blood on the finger okay so i think uh, john Can... so john now that you have done your examination you had your findings uh, does it change your diagnosis or anything you want to add what's your diagnosis now then so so uh, the syndrome will remain the same chronic constipation etiology will be probably functional however on uh, parietal examination i found that his sphincter was actually relaxing when he was bearing down and hence i would also uh, bring in a differential of a slow transit disorder along with the uh, dysenergic defecation So, Dr. Raki, Dr. Govind, any question? Dr. Raki, and we want to ask you at this stage. John, can you tell us the four types of dysenergic defecation uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Rao on manometry? Okay. So, uh, there are uh, four types: anorectal dysenergia type one is when there is uh, adequate uh, the rectal pressure increases, and paradoxically, the anal sphincter pressure also increases. In uh, type two. the rectal pressure is uh, does not increase but the anal uh, sphincter pressure also increases in type 3 the uh, rectal pressure increases but the anal uh, sphincter uh, relaxation is inadequate that is it uh, does it reduces only uh, to less by around 20% of the basal tone and in type 4 there is uh, rectal pressure is also inadequate and the sphincter anal sphincter relaxation is also inadequate Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, good. Dr. Govind, anything you want to ask him, sir? No, this this is fine. So the the only question comes that uh, 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 can, uh, can you go one slide back? Oh, yes. Uh, looking at uh, the PR and uh, uh, examination, uh, 
is important. And although many of us or most of us do not do PR examination, but sometimes PR give a lot of information. Uh, the point uh, which uh, John made that uh, squeeze pressure uh, tells you that uh, this is external sphincter. Uh, squeeze pressure means external sphincter pressure. And uh, one important point which made uh, uh, John to reconsider his diagnosis from pelvic floor to slow transit uh, at the differential was uh, uh, the point uh, which we found sphincter relaxation while bearing down. This is normal phenomena. So as you as you, as you patient try to pass stool, the sphincter should relax. But in pelvic floor dysmenorrhagia, the sphincter will contract. So this is called paradoxical contraction of sphincter. And this is a very important sign. In a patient with chronic constipation, if you do a PR and ask the person to bear down over your finger, and you find the, rather than relaxation, and this is a contraction of a inner sphincter, you feel squeeze, you feel pressure over your your, your index finger, it means uh, there's a dysfunction of uh, 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 dysfunction of uh, uh, relaxation of inner sphincter. And it's called anismus and, and all together called pelvic for dysenergy or dysenergy defecation. So this sign itself uh, tells the diagnosis in even in the outpatient that this is, looks like a dysenergy defecation. You can go and go and confirm by doing physiological, physiological testing, but this is very important sign. Similarly, if you find that pelvic descent uh, is inadequate or more is a rectal prolapse, so this e particular examination uh, adds a lot of value uh, to diagnosis. And those people who, who work on uh, this uh, GI physiology, uh, they, they believe the importance of constipation, uh, importance of PR uh, in making a diagnosis, right? And third thing was said, the, a third thing said, rectum is loaded with stool. It means what? Stool is coming to rectum, but rectum, rectum is not able to evacuate it. Why the rectum will be loaded with stool? It means uh, either the muscle of rectum is not able to contact appropriately to propel the stool out of rectum uh, during the process defecation. Number two, if there's a relaxation of inner sphincters, which does not allow a sphincter to, to, to relax, and patient has to really put in strain to pass the stool. The straining is important that the patient has to start, put a lot of strain. Uh, in passing stool, it means there is some problem uh, uh, at enorectal uh, physiology. So, and, and longer the stool stays in rectum, the stool becomes drier and drier stool are difficult to pass. So these are the pointed towards uh, pelvic floor dysenergia uh, in this individual. So I think, uh, so what I think is clear so far from the discussion of history and examination is that, you know, constipation, while we see commonly, there are so many points to evaluate in a patient who comes to us with constipation, there are a lot of elements in history to be covered. Then examination, especially rectal examination is so important. And if you do things properly, adequately, you will come to a conclusion about the underlying nature and severity, which will really help you in channeling your investigations further. So now I think we'll move on next to the investigation. So John, how would you like to invest? So this is a patient which you have presented now, which is, was not responding well to the laxatives you told us. So how will you like to proceed in evaluating this patient? Uh, first, I would like to rule out uh, metabolic causes. So I would uh, like to do a TSH level in him, a calcium level, a uh, blood sugar level, and uh, basic HB and uh, platelet count. So, the test. How do you what's, what's your interpretation of this test? So, so there is uh, TSH is normal, sugars are normal, calcium levels are normal. So the basic metabolic curve is negative. So then I would, uh, because he has chronic symptoms, he has partial relief to laxatives, and the symptoms are going on for more than six years, I would uh, like to confirm my diagnosis as for more specific tests. So the first is, I would like to ask for the... So John, before you, before discuss, I just to ask you, let's say if you saw a patient routinely in OPD, forget this patient you are seeing, if you saw a patient routinely in OPD, who's come to you with, uh, say, constipation for about a year, actually, and uh, and then he's not taken, I mean, he's just taken one or two laxatives, these investigations are normal. So in that patient, will you proceed to further investigation? Or basically, when do you decide, the question is, when do you decide that you have to go for further tests, and when do you think these tests are sufficient? So, uh, if... If a patient is having refractory symptoms, his symptoms are not improving with laxatives and uh, has tried multiple therapies, 
at that point i would like to try uh, i would ask for different investigation however if that is not the case i would give him a trial of i would explain uh, physiology of uh, education i would uh, reassure him advise lifestyle modification and give him a trial of laxatives and if he improves i would not proceed further so that's a very important point for everybody to understand that you know constipation being a, prom- a common problem in most patients we don't have to proceed to higher test the simple baseline test ruling out a secondary cause looking for metabolic is enough and then you can proceed to management and more than 80% of cases will fit into that category it's only in a select group of patients where you need to proceed further for further test and that again you will be well guided properly if you do a good history and examination to decide which patient i need to go for next investigation which patient i can stop and start treating so as john is saying that this patient you know, has tried multiple laxatives is not so much response so he appears to have a refractory constipation and therefore he would want to investigate further so what tests would you like to do in him john amit can i make a point out here yes sir yes sir uh, the two points number one that uh, i think we should appreciate uh, by the time patient comes to us uh, to tertiary care centers or to gastroenterologist constipation is not a disease uh, most patient will come to gastroenterologist as a first visit they would see their family physician at most places be a small town village or, or even a big town they hardly uh, some patient will come as a first consultation for constipation to gi before they come to you uh, come to a doctor they all first apply their local homemade remedy and and the over the counter treatment if they don't work they go to family physicians or the the i mean uh, then they go to secondary and then tertiary care center so by the time the patient comes to a gi at tertiary care centers either on individual practice or corporate practice or on on academic institutions they already have uh, gone through multiple level of uh, uh, cl- uh, multiple level trial of laxative for various kinds then they see us so we please keep that in mind that if you have already history of a uh, five six seven years of treatment of constipation then probably uh, this style of giving more laxative without investigating may not be a great idea um, maybe like uh, we like to dissect out uh, uh, this more that uh, does he really need con- uh, any investigation or not that's very true that's how this that's why we said this role of this history examination is so important to know that this patient we have to proceed in and tertiary care you're right the profile we see is like this only dr rati any comment you want to make sir one more, more, more comment i'd like to make out here so that, uh, we say that uh, uh, looking at uh, looking at tsh or sugar they could be associated phenomena that uh, is very less likely that somebody has hypothyroidism and come only with constipation for many years although we should do this test with the mind you that if your tsh was say in this patient was 12 but that's not a cause of constipation in him with 12 tsh if he has his tsh is 3 or 3.7 but it was 12 or 14 or 15 or say or even 100 uh, i mean classical hypothyroidism uh, his uh, constipation is not because of hypothyroid hypothyroid might have worsened his uh, symptom of uh, a uh, pelvic floor uh, dysynergia but uh, this is not only hypothyroid so we should also be, uh, also be aware that even in diabetes even in hypothyroidism there could be an additional disease uh, which lead into constipation these underlying metabolic disorders might be aggravating to severity of uh, uh, underlying disease which leads to constipation yes dr rati any point or comment here before we proceed further uh, john we, we know that this patient has a pelvic floor dysynergia So what I like to do now, uh, uh, manometry or other sophisticated investigations, or will you like to stop here? So, so because he has refractory symptoms and he has uh, tried different therapies, I would like to proceed further. I would ask for a inorectal manometry and a barium discogram. Yeah. So, uh, what is principle? Why you want these two tests? Uh, I mean, what you want to learn from by doing these two tests? so uh, in our rectal manometry we can look at the physiology of the uh, of the patient so how the rectum is behaving behaving and how the uh, uh, anal sphincter is behaving to dislocation the second thing with barium uh, discogram is one we can see uh, how is the inner rectal uh, angle is it changing with uh, dislocation uh, and uh, is there so we will get more clues towards the uh in rectal dysynergia and hence we can uh, confirm the diagnosis and treat so one is to confirm your diagnosis you will do any other advantage of doing these tests so, so uh, if we do a in rectal manometry we can uh, uh, advise for biofeedback therapy which would be the 
uh, mainstay of management in this patient. And reassure us to the patient. So reassurance, biofeedback, and to confirm the diagnosis. Okay, fine. So here you have the anal anorectal manometry, John. So you want to sort of uh, interpret this? So, so in this anorectal manometry, we can see that uh, uh, as the rectal pressure is going up, the sphincter pressure is also going up. So this would be suggestive of an anorectal dysphenia type one. Can you so, show? Uh, put yeah. an arrow. Uh, yeah. See that? Yeah. 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 So, so that's a normal area. Yeah. More towards the left. Yeah. So that's where the, the rectal, rectal pressure. pressure. Yeah. So. And the Yes, yeah, either you want to show that, uh, just go back, go back. You want to show in that uh, previous manometry the rectal pressure going up and the rectal pressure also not improving or increasing. Yeah, so this is the rectal pressure and this is the uh, inner sphincter pressure that is increasing. So I think, as John was saying earlier, that there are four types. I think in the type one, the rectal pressure increases, but the inner sphincter pressure also increases. And that's why it is a type one dysphenia. Okay. So next, you wanted to have a difficogram, John. So here's a difficogram now. So this is uh, in the neutral position. So we can see that uh, this is the anorectal angle. The perineum is well above the ischial tuberosity. And when he is uh, defecating, you can actually see that the angle is not changed much or actually has decreased further. And uh, if you see at the level of the ischial tuberosity, the perineum also has not descended much. So this is suggestive of a uh, dis uh, dyssynergic uh, defecation. See, in rectal manometry, one more point you, I mean, we didn't discuss was what about what is the role of this balloon expulsion test before we sort of say this? One more thing which we always do is a balloon expulsion test along with the thing. So, what's the role of balloon expulsion test, John? So, the balloon expulsion test is a uh, can be used as a screening method. So, generally, the balloon expulsion uh, less than one minute is taken as normal. So, uh, this patient had expelled it within uh, 30, 30 seconds. However, he has other features to suggest that he has a dysmetic. So now that you have a barium difficogram result, now you have the manometry. What's your uh, conclusion now? So, so now I would, uh, uh, as these two are strongly suggestive of a dysmetic dislocation, my diagnosis would be a dysmetic dislocation, and I would uh, manage him accordingly, sir. So, so, so do, you, do you need any further tests like a transit study in this particular patient? Uh, the only thing was uh, uh, at history, he did not have an urge to defecate and on examination, he had this sphincter relaxation. So to confirm, I can do a, a colonic transit study uh, to see if there is a, a slow transit concentration. Dr. Govind or Dr. Rakhi, any comments on this? What John is saying, the role of a transit in this patient? Any, any uh, problem. What is the problem with balloon expulsion test in our city? It was normal. Balloon was normal in this patient. The thing is what John is saying that this patient also based on his history and assessment, the rectal examination didn't find much features of uh, dysenergy. As we say, there may be overlap of transit with uh, dysenergic defecation. So there may be some chance of an overlap of transit. So he thinks it may sometimes be okay to do a transit study. So what's your take on that? Should you do a transit study or we should stop at that? Yeah, there could be overlap of, uh, as the disease progresses, uh, dyssynergic defecation can have a slow transit constipation. I agree with you. So there could be overlap. So to complete the workup, one should do transit study. Okay. So, so we have the transit study in this. Uh... So, so as the... Caesar, can you put the slide for transit study? Next one. Yeah. Okay. So John, so this is your the transit study pictures, X-ray at the end of the study. So what's your, how do you interpret this uh, image? So in this uh, transit study, we can see uh, various uh, radiopaque markers. However, the predominantly they are concentrated in the rectosigmoid uh, region, which is again suggestive of a uh, dyssynergic uh, defecation. That's again a very important point. If you look at this picture, what John is saying is that when you do a transit study and you do an X-ray, you also have to not only look at the retention of marker, but you also have to look at the positions of marker. In this patient, the markers are all in the rectosigmoid region. And so the right and the left colon is free, virtually free of markers, actually. So when the markers are in rectosigmoid, then again, it reflects a dyssynergic defecation rather than a slow transit constipation. Whereas if the markers were all over the place, you would have, so this patient, I think based on the manometry, you have a difficogram and even a transit study, although the markers are retained, but this will be read as more of a dyssynergic defecation than a slow transit constipation. So, so what's your now? What's your final so final diagnosis now, John? So my final diagnosis would be a, a tonic uh, functional tonic constipation 
secondly to uh, dyssynergic defecation. Next slide, please. So I think before we go further, there are a few questions in the chat box which we'd like to take. I think there's one question about uh, some, some person is saying that which investigation should we do first? Should we do the marker, the transit study first or should we do a rectal manometry first? So, so John, you would want to answer that? So, so again, this will depend on the symptom profile and examination findings of the patient. So here, as we had suspected uh, defecation, this is an idea as the first sequential, we would first do a anorectal manometry. However, because he also had some abnormal, uh, some things which are not fitting in, we would also like to rule out an overlap and hence uh, do a transit study as well. But first, we would like to do an anorectal manometry. Again, that's very important. So I think the test you do really depends on what your clinical assessment has been and you start with that test first, actually. Okay, there's another question that uh, is there a, if there is structural abnormality like rectocele with dysarhagia, do we still call it a PFD or pelvic floor dysfunction? So I think, I think it's right. See, once you see a rectocele on a defecogram, that again tells you there is excessive straining. At the same time, the sphincter is not relaxing and therefore the rectocele has formed. This again also reflects a pelvic floor dysarhagia. Other question is till what volume we should distend balloon for beat, the balloon expulsion test. So I think the standard is uh, about 50 what we do. We can go higher, but I think most of our practice probably we stay at 50. Uh, Dr. Rati, Dr. Govind, any other comments on that, sir? The balloon expulsion test. With balloon expulsion test, yeah, I would like to say what we normally do in our practice is uh, we ask the patient to expel the balloon in the when he's lying down the left lateral. Ideally, he should be going and sitting on a commode and expelling the balloon, which is difficult. So. Right. That is a practical problem. That's one of the same thing we do here. In fact, if the patient is spelling in that question, it's okay. Only if there's no expulsion, then you have to worry about the result. Because, But if somebody is able to expel it in that position, mostly I think it should be fine. And for practical purpose, that's what I think many centers do actually. That's about it. So in terms of volume, I think the balloon which we have doesn't have the compliance to go much more than, and that's the reason why we don't have, most of us don't have those balloons which can be distended to higher volumes. But that is usually, that is generally helpful in checking for rectal sensation, you know. And here we are looking more at an expulsion. Obviously, sensation is also an important component of defecation. But in most of the practice, we don't test it because we don't have those balloons with much higher distancing capability. Other question is about you know this MR. So is MR defecogram necessary in all patients with defecatory disorder? So you know, of late, people are moving towards MR defecogram. And the question is, is MR defecogram necessary? So again, the MR, the benefit is that it, see in the in the barium study, you only know about the lumen and about the prolapse and the angle, but you don't know much about the pelvic floor actually. Whereas MR gives you a good idea about the pelvic floor thing as well. So the information wise, you get much more information in MR, but obviously it's expensive and not available. So therefore for practical purpose, it may be still a barium defecogram in most centers. However, in our center now slowly, we have moved towards an MR defecogram because it's available and it gives you more information. Actually. Okay. I think there's another question about transit study. I think we'll take it up a bit later. I uh, again, about the transit, how it is to be interpreted. Okay, yeah, there's a few questions about that. Another question is about any role of sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy in this case. John, you would like to answer that? Is there a role of any sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy in your patient? So, so uh, this patient did not have any alarm features. So, and uh, his history examination is all suggestive of a uh, functional constipation, and he has features to suggest dyssynergic desiccation. So a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy is not warranted in this patient. That's very true. I think the studies have shown that the yield of colonoscopy is very poor. Actually, colonoscopy is mainly required when you have alarm features like you know some bleeding PR or weight loss, where you suspect an organic colonic pathology. Those are usually not very common. So usually not very helpful. Although if you look at guidelines for refractory constipation, some societies do recommend doing it in patients who are having refractory symptom and you're planning for like surgical intervention or something higher up, then I think we should do. Otherwise, usually colonoscopy is reserved for patients with alarm features. Mostly we don't do that. I think we'll, I think in the interest of time, we'll move to the management in this particular case. So Dr. Rati, you want to take up the management with John and this patient? Yeah, for that uh, the colonoscopy, what surprising finding you can find in this patient? Agreed, it is not required for diagnosis, but uh, what all you can get information on sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy? Yeah, very important, John, yeah. So, so uh, one is we can, uh, we can find fissures, internal hemorrhoids. Second thing is we can find the polyp, uh, which may later uh, increase in size. 
any small mass lesions can also be picked up okay. anything specific because of straining when somebody has lot of straining in stool any specific findings seen rectum john any rectal seal can be found interception can or a mucosal prolapse can also be seen any any mucosal any mucosal problem you see any any ulcers you can see uh, in rectum uh, so what is what is that ulcer called that is solitary rectal ulcer Yes, sir. So solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. Yes, sir. Sorry, U.S. hemorrhoids, fissures. Those you can see. Yes. A long-standing patient is on uh, laxatives. You can even find pigmentation, melanosis, for that. Okay. So, so yeah, Dr. Rakti, management. You want to take up management with John? How will you manage this patient, John? So, so uh, management, I would uh, advise uh, firstly some general measures and then specific measures. So general measures is I would uh, advise him to uh, increase his physical activity, take uh, uh, increase his fluid intake. I would also advise him to set apart a specific time daily for, uh, for uh, defecation, uh, uh, preferably within half an hour after a meal and to try for around half an hour in the, on the commode. I will also advise him about posture and also uh, to uh, to elevate his feet by keeping a six inch block below his feet and uh, try for at least half an hour. Uh, the specific management in him would be biofeedback therapy. Uh, and along with that, I would also give him a, maybe an osmotic laxative to soften the stool so that it can be expelled out uh, better. <clears throat> I think that's good. So essentially what you're saying is that some general measures as usual, then biofeedback therapy is the most important thing in this patient. So do you know what proportion of patients will respond to biofeedback therapy in this allergic application? So around 70% of the patients respond to biofeedback. Yeah. That's good. So I think that's good. So I think maybe because we are running out of time, one hour is over, we can maybe go to the second case and we can finish it. If anybody has, Dr. Govin, any comment you want to make, sir, before we move to the second case? Uh, a couple of comments and, and, uh, um, yes. and this is mainly for how do you investigate the principles of investigations? So first thing, if you have a patient with chronic constipation, summarizing everything together of this case, that somebody comes with chronic constipation and you find there are clinical features which takes you towards a dysenergic defecation, then we need to have a three important thing to answer. That the finger test or PR can tell us that you can confirm by 70% to 80% predictive value that this patient has dysenergic defecation. So putting a, doing a PR will be a wonderful thing to do, even if you don't have manometry. If you have manometry at your center, uh, please go ahead and confirm by doing a manometry. That's the most wonderful. But even if you don't, don't have manometry, don't worry about it because uh, we, we as a clinician has to move forward. Even in the, uh, in the, even we don't have clinical facilities and we do our best to our patients. So putting a PR, confirming on that, uh, making more, getting more evidence on correct examination will add value to your diagnosis. Well, if you have a manometry, then there are three principles again to know. The first thing that you want to look at the overall uh, uh, evacuation process and where you just do by balloon expansion test, put a balloon, inflate the balloon and ask the patient to pass the balloon. If patient is able to pass the balloon, it means what? The physiology of endorectum is generally normal. So a normal balloon expansion test probably will rule out or the prediction of having dysenergia is uh, much less. This is the first test, simple to do. One can even do a party balloon. Uh, you put over the catheter, push inside, inflate the balloon, and then and, and ask him to defecate, even without manometry, facility available to you. A simple test can be done. We can, uh, we can do with our little amount of jugard at our own, own centers. Third, if you have manometry, then you have a, uh, will tell you, uh, manometry will overall tells us what? It tells us the important process of which are involved in the defic defecation. First, the rectum will contract, right? And inner sphincter should relax. And this is what we measure in inner manometry. And based on that, these two forces, rectal contraction and inner sphincter relaxation, there are four types which uh, John has already discussed. Uh, just to summarize that, uh, normal defecation, rectum should contract sufficiently and inner sphincter should relax. But if there's a paradoxical con uh, relaxation or paradoxical contraction of inner sphincter, this confirms uh, that there is a uh, pelvic cord dysenergia and this is called type one. And depending upon the rectal pressure or relaxation, we define type one to type two, type three, four. So after we had done that, 
Uh, that's not end of it. We also want to know what the structure, structural defects or structural abnormality in the inorectal uh, apparatus. And this we can do by either barium defectography or better by MR defectography. Whatever available to your center uh, should be fine. This, this can tell us a recto seal, pelvic floor descent, opening of a inorectal junction. So all of these can be seen by, by this. And this is how you, you will able to pinpoint this patient has pelvic floor dysenergy because of rectal push is not proper, or there's an inner sphincter uh, relaxation is not proper. And, and this is uh, how you will investigate these patients. Uh, one other point I want to uh, emphasize here, that if you think of pelvic floor dysenergy, let us not give fibers. If you give fibers, uh, they will increase bulk of stool and rectum is anybody loaded from before uh, it will worsen symptom of patient, it will increase more pain and, and more worsening of symptoms. So fiber is not a remedy for uh, any patient with pelvic floor dysenergia. In that case, uh, as John said, that uh, you like to use some kind of flexative. And what is the principle? That you want the stool to become softened. The longer the stool stays in rectum, they become more dry. If they go more dry, they're difficult to, uh, difficult to expel. And therefore, you want to do some kind of drug maneuvering uh, which uh, soften the stool. So you can think of uh, what drug you can use. You can use a uh, polyethylene glycol. You can use uh, uh, some kind of uh, paraffin, uh, which is soft in the stool. You can use uh, some kind of uh, prochloride, uh, which can also add some water to the colon. But uh, most often it will be a polyethylene glycol-like preparation will do good to these patients. So, uh, and uh, once you do biofeedback, uh, uh, should give for a test. Uh, it's not about we need to teach biofeedback at their at our centers, but they should practice for a long period of time at their home. If they stop after six weeks of your effort in your hospital, uh, the most patients will go back to the normal after after a certain period of time. So this is a biofeedback like like things are almost continuous uh, efforts because uh, physiology is not going to change by that. Yes, Amit. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's an excellent summary of this case. So I think as we're running out of time, we'll probably have half an hour for the next case discussion. So thank you, John, so much for your case presentation. Let's invite uh, Dr. Nicholas to present the second case. Uh, so so before, before Nicholas starts uh, his second case, uh, uh, I would just like to uh, recommend reading the Indian Consensus on Chronic Constipation. It gives a good primer on uh, management uh, of uh, chronic constipation. So uh, again, it gives a uh, basic treatment and uh, uh, treatment of uh, refractory chronic constipation. So it would be good if uh, all of you can go back and read the Indian consensus. Uh, so I think this has already been answered by uh, John. Uh, so uh, for the interest of time, I'll, I'll go, we'll go to the next case. Yeah, I think yeah, we, can, we can skip this. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nicholas, if you can take over. Uh, <clears throat> presenting the second case. This is a 41-year-old gentleman, an engineer by profession from Delhi. His chief complaint was constipation for the past 30 years, that is since the age of 10. He gives a history of reduced stool frequency, less than one spontaneous bowel movement per week, without the use of laxatives. And also, his stool consistency was uh, Bristol 1 and 2, which basically consisted of hard, lumpy, pellet-shaped stools. Predominantly, he gives no history of an urge to defecate. There is no history of straining to pass stools, no history of sense of incomplete evacuation or inerective blockage. There is no history of any manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation, and there is no history of any abdominal pain. He also gives no history of prolonged fever, weight loss, bleeding per rectum, alternating constipation with diarrhea, abdominal bloating, vomiting, or feeling of lump per abdomen. There is no history of slowness of movement, neurological weakness, or bladder dysfunction. No concomitant drug intake like opiates, antidepressants, and calcium channel blockers. And there is no history of any comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, or hypothyroidism. Past history, there is no history of any previous abdominal or neurorectal surgeries. There is no history of trauma or injury to the back. Treatment history, 
in the beginning he tried some fiber supplements like uh, bulk forming uh, fiber supplements like this of bull later he tried multiple laxatives he tried a combination of osmotic both stimulant and lubricant laxatives but all of which had only partial response for the past one year he tried newer drugs like lubiprostone and procalopride before coming here for a short duration duration with partial response his ayurvedic preparations have also been tried but no real benefit all drugs have been tried for an adequate duration of at least a month stimulant laxatives and osmotic laxatives he says worked initially but then the response waned he never had more than three spontaneous bowel movements per week however he does say that the distal form had slightly increased to a score of more than 3 he has been on intermittent enema for for enema almost once per week for the past one year with which he has some relief the timeline of his uh, osmotic and uh, his uh, fiber intake initially he tried fibers in the first part of his uh, illness which when he realized it didn't respond he stopped later he tried osmotic and stimulant laxatives and recently he tried uh, ayurvedic treatment which didn't help him much newer drugs like procalopride and lubiprostone has been tried for a month and now before he's come to cmc he's been on enema uh, so far enema once a week personal history he does not consume alcohol he's not a smoker he has an active lifestyle and regularly exercises his appetite is normal there is no history of any weight loss his quality of life is generally good although he is worried about his lack of urge to pass food there is no history of any psychiatric illness such as anxiety depression or obsessive compulsive disorder he has never been on any antidepressants or any anxiolytics his diet history is mixed diet adequate calorie and protein intake fiber intake has been adequate and fluid intake is normal 2 to 3 liters per day there is no history of any colorectal malignancy or constipation in the family summarizing my history he is a 41 year old gentleman with no comorbid conditions or addiction with a history of chronic constipation for the past 30 years with no urge to defecate with a stool frequency of less than one per week no alarm symptoms and he has tried multiple laxatives and fiber supplements with only partial relief uh so before we go to the uh... to the discussion uh, this is uh, the second last poll question so which of these is not associated with constipation if you can just put up the poll please hello yeah so uh, diabetes mellitus hypothyroidism hypercalcemia ssris and calcium channel blockers stop the poll uh so 159 people answered so majority have answered correctly 67% felt it is ssri which is the right answer 17% felt it was hypercalcemia and 13% felt it was calcium channel blockers so the correct answer is ssri so uh so we need to know the uh, okay so we need to know the causes of uh, secondary causes of constipation and we need to rule them out in any patient who presents to us with constipation especially taking a very good drug history is uh, very very important uh, drugs like uh, uh, you know uh, any antispasmodics ondansetron any uh, opiates or even otherwise uh, taking any calcium channel blockers these are histories that uh, that is very relevant to a patient who presents to us with constipation so coming to the last poll question uh, just, so what uh, is the last... uh, uh, just one point out here yes sir that, uh, this is really important to look at drugs drug may not be the only cause of uh, constipation in a given individual but the drug might be precipitating like second hit so there may be a physio- there may, may be a, there may be a transit problem there may be a pelvic floor dysgenesia but they are compensated they are not symptomatic or they are mildly symptomatic but the second second factor on top of that uh, may worsen therefore these small small things uh, uh, sometimes do help that a good uh, a drug history the d- control of diabetes control of hypothyroidism all of these add value to treatment of uh, constipation yeah thank you sir uh, so 
sir uh, going to the next uh, last poll question what is the likely type of constipation in this case so Okay, so we'll end the poll here. So, uh, so eighty-nine percent have answered uh, slow transit constipation. Four percent felt it was dyssynergic defecation, and four percent felt it was mixed. So, I think we'll. So, just before we go into the discussion, uh, just uh, uh, something we need to understand about normal colonic uh, motility. So, there are two types of uh, activity that uh, occurs in the colon. So, there can be segmental activity or propagated activity. Segmental activity is usually arrhythmic, uh, associated with low amplitude uh, contractions, and leads to slow movement of the colonic contents towards the rectum. It's usually for making sure that there is optimal contact between the colonic contents and the colonic mucosa for reabsorption of fluid, electrolytes, and uh, the short chain fatty acids. Uh, Propagated activity, on the other hand, can be low amplitude, uh, predominantly for movement of fluid, or high amplitude that usually precedes uh, the uh, the sensation of defecation. Usually, uh, they are high amplitude up to 100 millimeters of mercury is the pressure. There is large movement of colonic content and may occur up to six times per day. And this is primarily responsible for the feeling of defecation that we get routinely. Okay, so coming to the discussion, sir. So Nicholas, now that you have presented your history, what's your uh, complete diagnosis now, clinical diagnosis? So the syndromic diagnosis is of chronic constipation, probably functional. The type is slow transit type with inadequate response to osmotic and stimulant lactose. No comorbid or concomitant drug use. So, Dr. Rathi, any question you want to ask at this stage? Dr. Rathi, connect it. Plus, uh, your phenotype diagnosis is slow transit. Uh, why do you say clinically it is a slow transit constipation? So, one, because uh, he's been having this constipation for uh, almost 30 years and his stool frequency is less than one per week. Second, is that because he does not have features of uh, uh, dyssynergic defecation like straining or fecal or using manual maneuvers to, uh, to help in defecation. Or any sense of incomplete evacuation. Predominantly, the most important thing is there is no urge to defecate, which uh, is in keeping with the diagnosis of slow transit. So I think what so what Nicholas, you are trying to say is that because there is hard, there is no urge for defecation and the stool symptoms are just once in a week or less than once in a week is passing stool, and also there are no features of a dysynergic defect. So all that put together, you are favoring a diagnosis of slow transit constipation. Is that what you are saying? Yes, Dr. Govind, sir, you want to ask him something at this stage? Hi, I think uh, no, just one second. Are you okay? Now we can hear you. Yes. Uh, please carry on. Please carry on. I'll join later. Okay. Okay. So I think essentially this is again. Uh, so I think we already discussed in the first case about how do we know it's a functional organic. I think the previous one, the features are more favoring a dysynergic here. The features are more favoring a sort. And I think the audience. Got it almost 100% right, and it's very most of them agreed this is a slow transit constipation. And here again, Nicola, just to reiterate, how did you assess that there was an inadequate response to laxatives in this in, in this particular patient? So in him also, uh, in spite of trying uh, fibers and osmotic and stimulant laxatives, his stool frequency never went up for more than three times per week. Though he does say there is some uh, consistency improvement in Bristol scale. However, he still never crossed the more than three times per week spontaneous bowel movement. That is why I'm saying that he did not respond to the treatment that was given. I think then, uh, Dr. Rati, shall we move to examination? I think you want to ask. Oh, Nicholas, one question. Oh, what is the relation of methane producing bacteria and constipation? So, there's been one study, I think, from uh, STPGI, which shown that. Uh, uh, methanoprevibacters methiae bacteria when it is there in patients with uh, when they produce methane it is shown that there is evidence of uh, that, that their motility is uh, impaired and that can sometimes cause uh, slow transit type of constipation it can worsen the transit yes. Yes. 
Dr. Govind, your voice, we can't hear you, sir. So you mute. So we can't hear you, Dr. Govind. We can't hear you. No, so we can't. Uh, we are not able to get your audio, sir. Meantime, can we go ahead? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, I think uh, yeah. So we'll go to the examination here. Yeah. On examination, the pulse was normal, BP was one twenty by seventy, respiratory rate was normal, height was one seventy, weight was sixty seven with a BMI of twenty three point one kg per meter square. There was no pallor, icterus, clubbing, stenosis, lymphadenopathy or fetal edema. There was no tyromegaly and there were no cutaneous signs of internal malignancy that were noted. On inspection. Abdomen was scaphoid with all portals moving equally. There were no visible masses, scars, or sinuses. There was no visible peristalsis. Palpation was soft, non tender. There was no organomegaly or masses palpable, and there was no ascites. Auscultation, bowel sounds were normal. CNS examination, high function, cranial nerve, and sensory system was normal. Motor system examination showed normal power, power in both the upper and lower limbs, and its uh, DTRs were normal. Systemic examination, cardiovascular and respiratory system for grossly normal. Looking at his digital rectal examination, on inspection, the perianal region appeared normal. There were no skin tags or hemorrhoids. Enocutaneous reflex was normal. Palpation showed no tenderness, masses, or strictures. The rectum was empty. Resting anal tone was normal. Squeeze pressure was good. Pushing and bearing down. No maneuver. It was showed normal push effort, push effort with sphincter relaxation, and there was no blood on the gloved finger. So, so what do you conclude from your uh, rectal? Go back to your previous slide. What do you conclude from the rectal examination, Nicholas? How do you interpret these findings? Sir, his uh, digital rectal examination was grossly normal. I didn't find any evidence of uh, dyssynergia or uh, any increase in or decrease in anal tone. Okay. Oh, yeah. Next slide. Yeah. So yeah. So so we'll go to next slide. Uh, so what's your? So does the examination change your diagnosis, or you still let the the diagnosis remains the same? Uh, no, sir. I still uh, stick with my diagnosis of chronic constipation with slow transit time. So, Doctor Rati and Govind, anything before we move to the investigations in this case? Anything you want to ask? So your voice, I think we can't hear you, sir. I think that's. Uh, Rati, anything you want to add? Meanwhile, Dr. Rati, anything? No, no, I think you should go ahead. So then, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll just, we'll proceed to the investigations actually. Okay. So, so Nicholas, how would you like to investigate this uh, patient? Uh, in him also, I would like to ask initial metabolic profile of investigations. I would look for uh, TSH, calcium, and uh, sugar, and also check his hemoglobin just to see if there's any anemia. Okay, so can we have those tests for him, please? So these are the reports. What's your interpretation of these tests? So it's uh, thyroid level calcium and uh, HDA1C is normal, and it's uh, platelets and uh, HP is also normal. Okay, so so are you happy with this test, or you want to proceed further in this uh, particular patient? So these are the general investigations I would initially ask. But to confirm my diagnosis of slow transit constipation, I would, I would uh, order a, a transit study. So, so the question is, why do you want to confirm your slow? I mean, what's the reason? Will you do it in every patient, or what's the reason for doing a test in this particular? What's the main reason you are going to test for transit in this patient? So for him, uh, I would like to confirm simply because of the fact that he's tried, uh, he's had refractory symptoms for the past 30 years. He's tried almost every uh, treatment that is available to him and he still not responded. So before I, uh, I want to treat him further, I would like to confirm my diagnosis before I can offer him another therapy. So, so that's a very important point. So if you look at this case scenario, it's about almost 30 years the patient has had symptoms. And I think his bowel movements have been about one or less per week. He's tried all sorts of medications. And finally, he's on 
enema every week for symptoms and that is giving him some relief so essentially it's a truly refractory case and uh, obviously on examination also we didn't find any evidence of a dyssynergia okay so this patient i think we'll have to probably think of further therapy so we need to really characterize his constipation properly as to if it's really a what type of constipation it is so that's why i think nicholas says he wants to have further test so what test would you want first in this patient uh, nicholas i would like to order a transit study a radio opaque marker transit study Okay, so do we have the yeah, transit study? So I think we can go to the next one, uh, Sridhar. Yeah. So this is the transit study. Uh, this is the so what picture is this, Nicholas? Transit. This is the baseline picture. The first day. Okay. We'll go to the next. Yeah. Go to the next one. Yeah. So so how do you interpret this uh, image? So this is a brain X-ray abdomen, which is showing. Uh, Oh, oh, sorry. Before, uh, before Nicholas, before you say, how do you interpret? Can you briefly just say how this test is done, and then you can interpret this image briefly. If you can say a few sentences, how this is done, and how do you interpret this image? So, how we do the test here is that we we uh, tell the patient to take a adipid fiber intake the day before the procedure, and uh, we tell him to avoid any medication which uh, which will impede colonic motility, uh, like uh, is uh, any calcium channel blockers or opiates or antidepressants. And then on the day of the procedure, on day one, before giving him the radio opaque marker, we'll do a scout film. Then we would uh, do, we would tell him to uh, swallow a capsule containing uh, 20 radio opaque markers of different sizes. On day one, uh, one capsule. On day two, second capsule. On day three, third capsule. And on day four, we will uh, do the uh, X-ray to look at uh, the distribution of the radio opaque markers. So I think so. You're using markers of different shape on three days, and then you're taking an X-ray. Okay, so this is now the final image after the fourth day. And so, how do you interpret this uh, image? So here, uh, I I would like to draw uh, from the L file to draw two lines to both the ischial to draw to both the ischial spine and divide them into right, left, and the recto sigma. If you you find that in this patient there is uh, radio opaque markers of different sizes and shapes distributed. Both in the left, left and the right colon, but there is nothing in the recto sigmoid area, suggesting that there is uh, some uh, pan colonic distribution of these radio opaque markers of different sizes, but it is not reaching the uh, recto sigmoid area, and also that uh, there is loaded uh, stool in the uh, right side and the left side. That's very important. So if you look at this X-ray, the right colon is also loaded with stool. So definitely, this also tells you even if you didn't have a marker. You see, there is so much of stool loading in the right colon, which tells you there is a slowness of transit. And obviously, when you are doing a transit study, as we discussed in the previous case also, that we are interested in looking the at the distribution of markers, not the percentage retained alone. So here, in this case, compared to the last case, what you can see, there are markers in the right colon, there are markers in the left colon, and there's hardly anything in the recto sigmoid. Last case, everything was in the recto sigmoid region. So this is what we normally see in a patient who has got a slow transit, where you have markers distributed. Right colon, left colon, everywhere, and most of them would not have got expelled at the end of study period. So I think this report was uh, it. They did report that this as an abnormal transit study. So what will you do next, uh, Nicholas? So, <clears throat> so uh, this is the result. Now, so what's your next uh, step? Next investigation. So after this, once you confirm the diagnosis, I would uh, start uh, management. So in this patient, now that you know slow transit, you have sort of uh, established. You still want to look for any uh, dysynergic defecation because the literature does say that about 20 to 30 percent patient who have slow transit also have a dysynergic uh, defecation coexisting. If that is the case, at least you can offer them some biofeedback because this patient is not responding to therapies He's on enema right now, and there is a possibility that 20 to 30 percent patients may also have a component of dysynergic defecation with slow transit. So, considering the nature of his symptom, the refractory nature, and what the situation he is currently in, would you also like to consider doing a, a, a manometry in this patient? Yes, sir. Uh, considering the fact that he is refractory and that there is some uh, definite overlap of symptoms, uh, which literature has shown that there is some dyssynergic defecation along with slow transit, which is possible. I would like to do a defecogram, barium defecogram, or a rectal manometry. So, so see that we have any of those tests in this patient? Uh, no, sir. So, uh, 
Okay, so as I think uh, that's one thing to remember that while we say we classify them into, you know, so one thing to remember in practical scenarios is that we put them into nice garden varieties, low transit, or dysanergia normal. There is uh, obviously a degree of overlap. Okay, and we know that when there's a dysanergia, the biofeedback works better than the laxatives. So therefore, when you have a case where there's a truly refractory case, nothing much is working. Always remember that there is also a possibility of having overlaps in patients who are having constipation. And sometimes there may be a role of doing at least a manometry to see there's no dysanergia. Although rectal examination did not show that, manometry may be okay in this patient. Okay. So, uh, so I think any other test uh, you want to do, Nicholas, or you're happy with the investigations now? So no, I'm happy with the investigation. Dr. Govind and Dr. Praveen, any comments, sir? Uh, so okay. can... Yes, sir. yes, we can hear you. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Hello. So now we can't hear. I think we were hearing for some time. Do medium diffography or manometry in this patient once the diagnosis is uh, more or less certain? Uh, I... Can you repeat your question, sir? I think, yeah. Graphy or the uh, Amit, please continue. Please continue. Yes, sir. Now we can hear. You. So please ask. Now we can clear it, yes, sir. So, so why do you want to do billing diffography or inoptimometry? Because see that uh, if not needed, uh, because the very specialized test uh, and they may not be needed in all patients unless we have a very strong suspicion of doing it. Dr. Praveen, any comments at this stage before we go to management? Can you manage Nicholas this patient? So, uh, in him also, I would try general measures of uh, lifestyle modification with adequate exercise and uh, fluid intake. See, see, well, Nicholas, this patient has a chronic constipation has got colonic inertia. Yes, sir. Uh, he has constipated 30 years. Now, still general measures he'll keep on doing, then he will go 40 years, he will have constipation. So, now he requires some remedy, no? Yes, sir. So I, in him, uh, I would, I would, I would I'd like to try the uh, newer prokinetic drugs like procalopride. I'd also like to try uh, stimulant laxatives like uh, bisacodyl and uh, um, like acetosodium picosulfate. That he must have had, uh, taken in the past also. Now what uh, you will now he has come to you for, you know, solace. He wants uh, some solution for his problem. So, in other words, when will you subject these patients for surgery, myectomy, ileostomy, anti-grade irrigation, and you say enough is enough now, no more medical therapy? So, I would give them an adequate trial of drugs first, the newer drugs like the prokinetics, and see if he responds to that. If in spite of this, if he does not respond, then I would refer him to uh, surgical management. Do you know what surgical managements are uh, sort of available in a patient with uh, refractory constipation? Yes, sir. The commonly performed surgery is uh, subtotal colectomy with iliorectal anastomosis. Uh, other options so before we do that, uh, we can check whether the he's got a component of small bowel uh, slow transit or even gastric emptying tank problem. If that is not there, then we can give him a temporary ileostomy to help. Uh, and then these are some of the options. That's, I think, again, important. So we have to make sure there's no other concomitant small bowel or other myopathy, neuropathy, or sort of pan-GI dysmotility, because in that case, the procedure may not help much, actually. Okay. okay Dr. Govind, then, any, any comments, sir, before we close this case? Sir, uh, yeah. I'm not audible now. Yeah, you're no, audible. audible. Yeah. Yes. So what I'm, uh, the surgery is the last resort. No. Only. Surgery is not the option. We'll try all forms of uh, colonic stimulant. And sodium picosulfate, once a dose, twice a dose. And uh, can you go to of X-ray? Uh, uh, so we can't hear you. Uh, now it's better, sir. Now it's better. Okay. So, uh, can you show the slide of X ray? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. So, look at uh, this. Now we want to tackle this colon, and which is colon which is loaded with stool. Yes. So, you can show the loaded stool uh, by an arrow. 
So we need to do something. Whatever you do is not going to work because the, the two things are there. That the colon is obstructed because of a dry stool, number one. Number two, that it cannot propel. So there are two physiological problems here. That the colon cannot propel the stool, one. Number two, there's a dry stool out here all over the colon. So even the colon propels, normal colon propels, this will not be able to propel because this is obstructed lesion. So this is a long battle, not a short battle, it's a long battle. What do we do? We want colon to move. So that you use colonic stimulant, like you would sodium picosulfate or dulcolax. If they don't work, you can even try neostigmine. Three things one can do, sodium picosulfate, once a dose, twice a dose, uh, a day or, or sodium or dulcolex or even neostigmine. Start with 15 milligram and then you can go up to 30 to 60 milligram per day or, or pyridostigmine. Uh, you can use pyridostigmine for a longer period of time. This is number one. So you allow colon to, to contract. Second, uh, even colon contracts, so how do you move these tools of, out of the colon? You have to use something which can flush out. So use peglec, use uh, uh, say polyethylene glycol. Okay, you give plain water, the plain water will get absorbed in the small intestine. Therefore, want a force from, from ever, and what, what could be the force from ever? Could be polyethylene glycol. So give polyethylene glycol, which slowly they, they will not be absorbed in the small intestine. They come to large intestine and they will seep through the empty spaces of the, of the colon and maybe take some stools down with it as they pass through the large intestine. So giving polyethylene glycol, twice a day, once a day, depending on patient's symptoms, are the second thing to do. Giving only one kind of therapy will not going to work. Giving more fibers to these patients is further going to worsen. So no fiber for slow, this kind of slow transit because this whole colon is obstructed. Therefore, uh, the strategy will be to con allow colon to contract by using whatever drug we have. We don't have great drugs, but whatever drug we have is a sodium picosulfate, Dulcolex, or, or, or bisacodyl or pyrostigmine. Second, give some kind of therapy which allow this, uh, the balls of uh, stool to move uh, down uh, from left to, uh, from right to left colon. So these two principles uh, one need to use. A uh, couple of more points I want to make here that if you have a, this kind of X-ray and somebody comes to you with uh, uh, passes to one stool a day, uh, one per week, is nothing but a slow transit. There's no doubt. If you have one week, uh, once a week stool is fine, but if it's a history is repetitive, that's year after year or months after month, the patient passes one stool per week, even two stool per week, or, or even less than that, is nothing but slow transit constipation. They may be associated IBS, associated IBS, they may be associated pelvic floor dysenergia, but the diagnosis is slow transit constipation. Therefore, all your treatment, all your investigation will be uh, driven towards uh, slow transit constipation. This is number one. Number two, the other point that us to pass tool. So uh, then the first case we emphasized was uh, anal, I mean, anal examination or endorectal examination, which gives a lot of idea about uh, the endorectal function. Here in patient constipation, us to pass stool is very important feature. If somebody does not have us to pass stool for, for days and weeks together, is nothing but slow transit. Uh, or if, or second thing is, is there is a rectal hyposensitive, uh, rectal hyposensitivity. It means stool is coming to rectum, but rectum is not able to perceive its sensation. The two things, that rectal is not able to perceive its sensation, it means what rectal hyposensitivity, and which occurs in multiple conditions, of, uh, of those who have a, a neuropathic illness or myopathic illness, right? So more of neuropathic illnesses and there are a number of them, true? So urge to pass a stool, somebody doesn't urge to pass a stool, uh, weak, there's nothing but slow transit constipation. And, and third one, that if you have this kind of X-ray and if you don't have a, a slow, you don't have studies for, uh, studies for doing a, uh, a slow transit study studies, then don't worry about it. You're almost sure. There's a patient with chronic constipation, long time, no, no, no value of, uh, no effect of uh, your local laxatives. There's no urge and stool and extra like this 
this uh, nothing but stored transit constipation. Don't bother if you don't have a, a, these markers. Uh, most of us do these markers by cutting the uh, uh, the the NB tube, the, the nasobiliary tube, or some radio opaque theaters. We cut the small pieces, put in the capsule of uh, say any vitamin, the empty the capsule, fill these uh, these uh, cut markers in the capsule, and improvise in your own setting. And one more point I want to make is uh, if you go back to uh, see there to the uh, the Bristol stool chart, any of the slide. Yes, sir. This is a most underplayed uh, or under uh, utilized uh, tool, which is a great tool. It's a great tool. I also didn't realize the importance of this, but once I understood the value of this chart, uh, is is remarkable. Look at normal stool is type three and four, which is a well hydrated stool, which is a soft uh, in consistency. If you go up in the ladder, you have type two stool and type one stool. What is type two and type one? Is more dehydrated. The stool was there, there, but this is more dehydrated. The, the colon has absorbed the water from this stool. Therefore, the surface becomes cracked. The surface not now type four is smooth surface, but type two is a more rough like cobblestone surface. It means what stool is dehydrated. And if a stool dehydrated, it breaks into small pieces. It's called pellet stools. These are pellets to type one. Why type one? Why type two? It means this stool stayed longer in the colon. Therefore, the colon absorbed water from this either colon or in the rectum. Therefore, they become dehydrated and they break into small pieces. So this is what type one and type two, they are, type one will tell you is, is something which is a more stasis in the colon. So this confirms either slow transit or rectal stasis in pelvic floor dyssynergia. So this is very important. And as you go down, there's more water, five, six, seven, more water, in this more diarrhea. Some patient will come to you uh, with chronic constipation outpatient. I, it happens every time in outpatient. Patient tells me that uh, I have constipation for say last uh, six years. And if you give, so the pistol tool chart on your phone, just open the Google and open on your phone and show them. They say, I passed type five stool, but I pipe th uh, three times a day, but still say constipation. You know, this is not constipation. This perceived constipation. This is the, if at all is a diet, diet type of stool, is not constipation. So this, showing this chart to patients is a really, really changed at least my practice. And, and it's so easy to do, open the, uh, open the Google, open this tool chart on the phone, is extremely simple. Or keep this photo at your outpatient uh, uh, clinic and show to the patient that what kind of stool you pass. So uh, three things I said was that uh, if somebody has a no urge to pass stool, if somebody has a, a low, very low frequency of stool per week, and third, if you have a stool chart type of type one, uh, you are you sure that there's a prolonged transit, prolonged stasis of stool in the in the in somewhere in the GI tract. And lastly, that many of these patients can have a multi-system disorder or or multiple sites of disease may be involved. If they have a dysphagia, if they have a a gastro features of gastroparesis or bloating, then you, are, you know, it's not a local colonic disease, it's a more diffuse disease. Amit. Thank you, sir. I think there are quite a few questions, but because we now only have about 10 minutes left, I think I'll go on to my summary of summary presentation if we can go for the next one, actually. Yeah. So I'll, I'll present uh, briefly about an approach to constipation, what we have discussed in today's meeting. So let me just share my screen. So is my uh, slides, are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, just to summarize what we have uh, discussed in today's uh, couple of case discussion. <clears throat> so when you see a patient with chronic constipation, how do you clinically approach that patient? So as we have said that it's a common clinical problem and what Dr. Govind has been stressing repeatedly is that the patient's perception of constipation is, is different and we need to have objective measures like a Bristol stool form scale, the frequency, et cetera, to know that, you know, so we need to have some objective measures of assessing the nature and severity of symptoms. And because most of the patients with constipation do not require any specialized testing, they just need few baseline tests and you can treat them. So therefore doing a good history, good clinical examination 
will really help us in deciding what patient we can manage without further tests and what are the very few or a small select group of patients where we have to proceed for higher investigations. That's something to remember that please remember while we have been discussing this special test like manometry, dipigogram, et cetera, in majority of cases, those will not be required. Okay. So again, so the essential components of history, which was covered in the presentations today is that we need to know about the duration of symptoms. What is the frequency? Is the patient straining during defecation? Stool consistency, again, very important using an objective measure like a Bristol stool form scale. Does the patient have sense of incomplete evacuation? Is there a feeling of enorical blockade or obstruction? Is the patient using any maneuvers like digital evacuation or pelvic floor support, et cetera? And again, very importantly, does the patient have urge to defecate? So these are again a cardinal features to assess when you are uh, determining the nature of the symptoms. So frequency, straining, consistency, use of digital maneuvers, urge for defecation, et cetera. And again, so showing the chart to a patient is probably much better than you trying to interpret based on his description of what form it fits in. So always good to show a chart. So you can have a chart in your clinic, which you can use and show the patient. It will be quicker assessment and more reliable than the patient description. Then once we get an idea about the symptoms per se, we should ask for associated symptoms like does the patient have abdominal pain, especially if somebody has a pain which is related with the bowel movement or associated with the change in consistency of stool, then we can think of an IBS uh, constipation. Bloating is a very commonly associated symptoms in patients with chronic constipation. Look for any coexisting functional GI disorders. Alarm symptoms have been nicely discussed by Dr. Sridhar in his presentation. And also prior laxative is very, very important because you need to know what laxatives patient has used as he used them in adequate dose. Dr. Dr. Govind was saying that if even for slow transit, you should use adequate amount of a picosulfate or a bisacodyl or whatever. You should use adequate amount for an adequate time before you say somebody is not responding. Often what you see in practice is patients should have skipped through multiple treatments without trying any of them properly. So you should have a proper idea about what the patient has tried before, before you decide your therapy. So this history is again, very important to get. Then again, we need to ask history for any associated conditions or a secondary causes of constipation, which can either cause or most often, which can actually aggravate the symptom as Dr. Govind was saying. So uh, in, a, in a woman, any history of obstructive trauma, Comorbid illness like neurological disorders, metabolic conditions like diabetes, hypothyroidism, psychological disorders, history of Hirschsprung disease, etc. Drugs, again, a very important cause of, of worsening of constipation or they can cause constipation like opioids, CCB, etc. Again, Sridhar has discussed this in his presentation. Diet and lifestyle. Is the patient taking adequate fluid in, the, in his daily? Is he on adequate fiber in his diet? How is his physical activity? Is the patient smoking? Because again, smoking can sometimes worsen the symptom. And also another important point, which we should be asking is about the toilet pattern. Is the patient going at a particular time every day? Is he spending adequate time? Because some people may have variable timing. They are in a, in a big hurry when they're going to the toilet. So these things may impact your bowel movements. So all these things have to be assessed when you are assessing a patient. And also how the symptoms have impacted his quality of life. Is there any family history of this condition? Okay. Examination again, very important. General examination, systemic and covering all the systems, abdomen, neurological, et cetera. And finally, we have again emphasized in all the cases, which we have, both cases we discussed today, the importance of a good rectal examination. And again, Dr. Sridhar showed that if you do a good rectal examination in about 70 to 80% of the case, you can get an idea about the presence of underlying dyssynergic defecation. So do not uh, underestimate this. This is a very important test to do when you're assessing somebody with constipation. So once you have all that, then you have all the required inputs to decide that now, okay, this patient, what is the current situation? So constipation, is it likely to be functional or organic? Based on your examination, is it going to be a strain examination? Is it likely to be a dyssynergic defecation or a normal or slow transit constipation? How has the patient responded to laxatives? Does he have any comorbid illness? What other medications he's taking? So these are the inputs you need at the end of a strain examination to decide how to proceed further. And in most cases at this stage, probably you'll just have to move to therapy. You won't need to go for higher investigations actually, okay? So the initial evaluation, as I told you, is good history and evaluation. If the patient has any alarm features like bleeding per rectum, or if there's any alternating diarrhea and constipation in an elderly patient, okay? If there's weight loss, we may have to do a colonoscopy. Otherwise, colonoscopy does not have a major, uh, any significant role in evaluating patients with constipation, okay? Then we check for metabolic conditions, okay? So once we have done this initial assessment, look for secondary causes, look for drugs, psychiatric disorders, actually we can move to therapy. We don't have to go for further investigation. So this therapy, as I said, 
whatever underlying treatable cause is there we can if whatever we can manage we should manage them lifestyle wise educating the patient about the condition importance of adequate physical activity good amount of fluid every day dietary fibers and often we start therapy with a bulk forming laxative lecithin and the, among the other drugs which are commonly used are pegalec lactulose and magnesium these are the osmotic laxatives in some patients when they don't respond we can go to the stimulant laxatives like bisacodyl sodium picosulfate or sena these drugs i mean there is always concern about side effect to long term use but however studies have not shown them to be as bad as it is thought so if you have a patient where symptoms are not responding i think do not hesitate to try this long term because remember persistence of constipation can lead to other problems like fissures hemorrhoids prolapse rectocele etc so i think if you have to use a higher level of drug i think you should not hesitate because literature has not shown too much of side effects from these drugs like bisacodyl picosulfate but again they are not our initial choice initially we use osmotic laxative then we go to the stimulant laxative okay and finally after trying all this if the patient has not responded to therapy that's when we call it is a refractory constipation and those are the patient select group of patients where we need to do this investigation what we discussed in today's cases we need a manometry with balloon expulsion test a defecogram and a transit study based on this we can characterize it as a normal transit constipation if everything is normal this synergic defecation if the defecogram or manometry is abnormal a slow transit if the transit is abnormal and sometimes as i told you there may be overlap as well so you don't have patients fitting all the time into this, this defined categories okay and having this categorization is important because that's when you will decide on the management so again the tests which we do are the colon transit again it has been discussed so transit study there are different methods of doing you do a single marker take multiple x ray the example which we showed at our center we give multiple markers on three days and we take a single x ray after that and there again we divide the colon into three segments the right and the left and the recto sigmoid and we use l5 spine as a landmark okay and the, from there you draw a line to the brim on the pelvis on the right side and the iliac crest on the left side and up in midpoint of spine above then you have the right segment the left segment and the recto sigmoid and then you can assess what proportion of markers are retained in these areas and decide about a right colonic abnormal transit left colonic transit or a recto sigmoid retention there are other methods as well like scintigraphy and capsule which are used but the most commonly one is the x ray method defecogram again it's been discussed we just to reiterate that in defecogram you look at the anal rectal angle so this so anal line anal line you draw a line through the midpoint of anal canal and a line through the posterior wall of rectum and this is the anal rectal angle so you look at this angle increasing normally it should increase when there's a defecation that's what you're looking at you're looking at perineal descent presence of any recto seal and any intersection okay and finally for manometry again manometry what we are looking at is the uh, sphincter pressure at resting squeeze pressure what happens during simulated defecation because this is what tells you about the different types of dyssynergia presence of any recto anal inhibitory reflex and the balloon expulsion test so if you look at this picture this is the sphincter at uh, normal and then when the patient is trying to bear down or pass stool then there is a pressure in the rectum and the sphincter relaxes this is how normally it is and when this mechanism fails if the sphincter contracts rectum doesn't uh, contract adequately that's when you get a dyssynergia so this is my last slide so once you have done a transit study you've done a defecogram and a man again the investigations you do depends on the symptoms you are dealing with so first case the symptoms are like a dyssynergic so we begun with the defecogram and manometry in second case which nicolas presented the symptoms are more sounding like a transit and that's why we stop with the transit study so once you have a sort of classification if it is dyssynergic defecation then the then the main therapy in this group is biofeedback therapy up to 60 to 70% will respond and as dr govind was saying that if you can give them something to stop in the stool like an osmotic or other one then it will even help further in evacuation but the primary therapy is a biofeedback therapy the slow transit which was the second case which we discussed there again i think the fibers to be avoided and the drugs which may be helpful are stimulant and propanetic and again do not hesitate to use stimulants use them in good dose because patients will respond surgery as dr govind was saying rightly is one of the last options and seldom done in fact i was looking at a series among the patients referred for surgery less than 10% finally undergo surgery because surgery has its own issues so really you try your medical management as much as possible before you think of those drastic measures actually okay so and we have now agents available like butanolpride which can help us in a slow transit constipation for normal transit the options are a bit more and we can use any of them so with that i come to the end of my presentation i think we have almost run out of time so probably i'll have to stop and uh, so thank you to both nicolas john and everybody on the panel for your participation dr govin dr ratti dr sridhar over to you dr govin
I can take a couple of uh, important questions. Okay, uh, right. So, uh, I mean, the questions which are, I mean, I, I just we can take a couple of questions which are, I believe, are very, very important. Yes, sure. And, 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 and at least uh, uh, the question which is, uh, uh, you go to stool diary. I think uh, uh, Indra Kala Garis asked about you go to stool diary. I think this is a wonderful uh, suggestion that if you give a stool diary to patient and, uh, and see that uh, how many stools they pass per day and how it improved with her treatment is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, and this is what most people will do. Other question, uh, do you want to explain? Asis asked about RAIR. I want to take this, RAIR. Yeah. So RAIR basically stands for rectoanal inhibitory reflex. So whenever there is a distension in the rectum, the sphincter will relax. That's when you do a manometry, that's what one of the components you report during manometry is an RAIR. So RAIR is that when you distend the balloon in the rectum, the sphincter should relax actually. And that is something which is what is present, what is present, what is a normal response, normal physiology. Somebody like somebody has say an Hirschsprung disease or something in those conditions, the RAIR may not be present. So that's one of the features to suspect, although that's a very uncommon condition. Again, in patients who have dyssynergia, like that's what we are seeing. And when somebody has a dyssynergia, when the rectum is sort of distending with the balloon for uh, defecation, the, there is a paradoxical contraction of the sphincter. But RAIR classically is basically distending the balloon, looking for relaxation, one of the tests for patients with Hirschsprung disease. And abnormality is also seen in patients who are having dyssynergy. Uh, there's another question, which is, uh, again, very important and very important practice point, uh, I would believe, that the role of fibers in constipation and when to start. Dr. Ati, you want to take up that question, sir? Role of fibers in constipation, what's your practice with fibers? I think uh, Govind will be able to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, look at the fiber. Now, how this question of fiber came into being? So it was, it came from, uh, say, mainly for Western countries. And Western countries, uh, say, about uh, 30, 40 years back, uh, the fiber intake was very low. You know that if you travel uh, outside now, you find a lot of leaves in the uh, in any of their lunch or dinner. Uh, because earlier people used to take more refined food and fiber intake was very low. All societies of nutrition recommend at least 30 to 40 gram of fiber per day. And it's found that in the US and uh, many other European countries, the fiber intake was just 20 gram per day. Therefore, the question came, uh, why don't you use 20 more gram of fiber to improve constipation? This is genesis of fiber into uh, the, uh, uh, in the, in the arena of chronic constipation. So now, now coming to our own country, uh, most people in all sides, north, east, south, west, majority of us, I won't call everyone, but uh, uh, many people have uh, already gone Western diet in their own home. But the majority of Indians, uh, all sides of our country, North, East, South, West, uh, still follow uh, vegetables, uh, fruits uh, in their diet. And most Indians have a food a fiber intake of uh, more than 40 gram a day. So adding fiber to, to that uh, is not based on principles. So those patients who are not taking fibers, they will certainly we add fibers, but they will take a normal diet and they're getting enough fiber in our, in our country. Second point is, the, the second point, the second point is, 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 is the, is the, is the, is the, uh, the second point is uh, the, the, if you give more fiber to this patient, they will have more pain. So start with fiber in chronic constipation uh, in majority of them, but again, be aware that these fibers may not add value to, to treatment. It, sometimes it can worsen uh, the symptoms uh, uh, some, from point of time, yes. So other question was, uh, uh, the last question was, uh, uh, how do you do biofeedback and how long each session will last uh, for biofeedback? So, so I think biofeedback again, uh, Nicholas, you want to try? I mean, we, we, uh, okay, I'll just answer. So basically biofeedback, again, this is not right now available. In, although the number of centers offering it are now increasing, the thing is it's a time-taking procedure and also you need to have a dedicated staff who's trained well in doing this procedure. So basically in a biofeedback, what we're showing the patient is in real time with the help of a manometry, that what is abnormality which he's having when he's trying to pass a stool. So we use this balloon, distended balloon in the rectum and there is stimulated defecation. And when he is trying to, Defecate, then we are showing the abnormality which is happening on the monitor in terms of rising rectal, rising sphincter pressure and inadequate propulsive force. And then we slowly try to correct that abnormality in that patient. That's the basic principle of it. 
and this takes about ideally you should be saying two to two to three sessions a week and it should go for about six weeks but again because of logistic region and the resource constraint this protocol may not be practical for most of the centers for us also we can't do it for six weeks but we do offer them for a week or two and then as dr govind also was saying that once you teach somebody the biofeedback thing the patient should be trying that it's not that after you're trained in the score in your endoscopy area the work is done the patient should be learning that and then he should be trying it for a sustained period of time to get any benefit Dr. Govind, anything you want to add to this, sir? Yeah, uh, I would like to add one thing. Uh, about yeah, yeah. Uh, RAIR, we somebody asked. Uh, mm -hmm. You answer it is absent in Ashwin. But the most common cause of absent RAIR is a technical reason. So you cannot diagnose just Ashwin on the basis of absent. Many times uh, you get a report of absent RAIR, people think that the patient has got a Ashwin. So, so definitely, it's not a single test, but it's one of the characteristic feature in that situation. But obviously, it's, as it's a rare condition, and you don't diagnose it, you need multiple tests. You need a barium to show an empty rectum, a filled sigmoid. Even you need a full thickness biopsy to diagnose. So that's one of the indicators, basically. But truly, I think it's, it's not a diagnostic test, basically. Right. Like you rightly said, again, at home, you have to give biofeedback at 0, 1, 3, 6. Months. It should not end with 6 session. It is a long procedure. Yes, yes, yes. How is it in AIMS, sir? I mean, the biofeedback, is it how we, I mean, do you give longer period? Also? We do weekly for 6 weeks. Sometimes we give also for 8 weeks. Uh, 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 because we uh, so that uh, weekly for six weeks, sometimes to eight weeks, and uh, we ask them to maintain a Cle Cle Cleveland constipation score diary, and based on that we assess if they're improving. But we always encourage them to uh, do these uh, learning points at home and yes. maintain that. Yes, yes. So I think it's a one of again. I would like to again just summarize that part again. That this synergic defecation is something of an ignored thing in our country, and because biofeedback therapy has such a good response rate in that condition, you know. So if you can identify those patients based on the history and examination, probably those guys subjecting them to laxatives without correcting the physiological problem, I think is not a good way forward. So I think all of us probably will have to think about that aspect and you know, try to get sort of biofeedback training and more and more freely available in our country and spend some time because this means reduced use of drug, better response, and the patient's quality of life also will be better. So this is one area which I think is a lacuna in our country because of the patient load in the facility, but something to really improve upon. I think with this, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, discussion today. Uh, a very important clinical problem of chronic constipation. How do we approach? Uh, Dr. Amit and his team had shown two cases, uh, two classical cases of uh, uh, of slow transit constipation and uh, pelvic floor dysgenesia, uh, which is the classical way they present. But again, again, no, many of these patients will have overlap. So this was just clinical uh, case scenario. But again, we, patient will vary in in our practice. Uh, with the various combinations. Uh, the uh, First to the, all the participants, uh, this has been wonderful to see all of you here. And I hope this uh, these masterclasses making differences in your understanding of uh, some of the clinical cases uh, which we discuss here. Uh, you have been wonderful today because all the polls which uh, Dr. Sridhar showed, uh, the, you were all bang on right. Uh, it means that uh, our understanding of disease physiology is, uh, is, is wonderful. I think we must congratulate each one of you uh, to putting the right diagnosis in both the cases. Uh, John and Nicholas uh, discussed the case uh, uh, most wonderful way. Different problem, but they, they highlighted, the, they discussed the case uh, very appropriately. The history was remarkable, what we should ask, what we should uh, add, and how to interpret uh, the history into a clinical uh, diagnosis. So thank you, John and, and, uh, and Nicholas, for, and congratulations to both of you uh, to making this uh, a panel, a wonderful experience for, for all of us out here. Uh, Dr. Rati and Dr. Amit, uh, thank you so very much because these two cases discussed very well, very important point brought, a lot of learning point uh, uh, put forward uh, to, to our thoughts and, and some, of, some of the malpractice or some of the misunderstanding uh, have been resolved uh, by, by both of you. Thank you so very much uh, for participating in this uh, Masterclass, Sridhar. Yes, yeah, as usual, you have been wonderful. Your questions you 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 made uh, were remarkable. I think uh, uh, they are very nice questions. And thank you so very much for your participation. So with this, uh, we stop for today's uh, presentations. We invite you to join next week again on next Sunday. Uh, again, another topic, and this will be on approach to lump abdomen, which is also a very important. Uh, clinical topic, how do you, uh, I mean, make a diagnosis of a lump abdomen. So this case will be, will be uh, presented 
next week. Till then, uh, thank you very much. Have a great Sunday and uh, enjoy. Thank you so very much for, for watching this masterclass. Uh, thank you, Dineshji. Uh, thank you, Yogita, for organizing this uh, uh, masterclass. And we'd like to see you next Sunday. Okay, bye-bye. You can log thank off you. now. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you all of you. Bye.